Hey guys, Nathan at Duck River Honey, and today I want to talk about summer hive management. Um, just real quick, my goals in summer are to try to continue to draw comb, to make sure that my hives are really healthy and set up well for fall and winter, and also to manage for dearth. So to really get into summer hive management, I'm actually going to start with spring hive management, and I'll link to a video here. But uh, my spring management is based on trying to expand colony size and make my colonies as big as possible. Uh, this takes advantage of the two and a half times rule of bees. So double the colony size and honey production goes up two and a half to three times. So from an operational efficiency standpoint, wooden wear efficiency, uh, per, you know, wooden wear per honey production, it's a lot more efficient to have fewer bigger colonies than it is to have a lot of small colonies. You get more honey from those bigger colonies and you've got less wooden wear invested in them. So my entire spring management strategy is trying to make these huge hives. And I succeeded in that in, in large part. My biggest hive I think had three mediums for the brood area and then five medium supers on it. Well, that creates some challenges if you're trying to work with hive health. If you want to get down and check for queen right, you've got to shift those five supers off and then put them back on. Uh, if, you, if you do that across the entire yard, it becomes a tremendous amount of work. So during spring, I typically just monitor for dwindling population. And by doing that, monitoring the entrances regularly, I did find a queenless hive and was able to correct that situation before it became a dead out that uh, was eaten up by wax moth and small hive beetles. So, Preservation of resources is really my goal in making sure that my hives have queens in them. And this is a key point. Preservation of resources is really what I'm after. It's not doing a queen right check. Um, it's great if my, all of my hives have queens in them. Don't get me wrong, that's great. But I'm not managing individual hives. I'm managing an apiary. And what I'm really interested in is to not have nasty dead outs that wax moths and small hive beetles overrun. So um, as long as I have a strong enough population within a hive to keep that, that comb preserved and protected, I don't really have to know that it has a queen in it. That's a key point that we'll get into in a few minutes. My second main goal for summer is to try to continue to draw some comb. So what I did when I pulled honey, um, I'll leave a link to my honey pull and honey extraction videos. I think those are really useful for, especially for operations that are my size. Um, so I just got done with that a week ago. And when I pulled all of my honey supers off, I put an empty box of foundation on with a double frame feeder. And this does several things for me. Uh, first and foremost, I've got these big populations. It gives them somewhere to go. And if I have a hive that has a smaller population, giving them a box of foundation is not going to create too much space. You know, everybody talks about too much space for the bees to protect. Well, with foundation, there's nothing to protect. Small hive beetles and wax moths can't attack that. So it gives the bees somewhere to hang out. If they have some excess capacity, excess energy, they can go up and start drawing that out. It gives them good, honest work to do and that can help to prevent robbing. So what having that box on there for me today does is I can check very quickly to see if the bees have gone up and started to draw that box out. I have not fed these bees, so they've had nothing since I pulled honey. And if they are drawing wax yet, and I've, I've already peeked in a couple and I, I see that I've got some that are, some that are not. So if they're drawing wax already, I'm just going to feed those bees, close the lid, and, and call them queen right. They've got the population that I'm looking for to preserve those resources, and I'd, I'd say that there's probably a 99% chance that they're going to be queen right. So I'll show you what I'm talking about on queen right checks. I'm really checking for population. And indications are pretty good on this hive. You can also look at the entrances and you see I've got tons of bees on all of the entrances. So I don't see any issues, anything that sticks out. Again, this foundation has been in here about a week and they have not been fed at all.
And you can see that they are starting to draw that out already. They're actually drawing this next frame more than this one. And the next one. See just how many they've got wax on. So out of the eight empty frames that I gave them with really no flow, no feed, they are drawing wax on about six of those in a week. Um, in my mind, that means this, this hive is doing everything it should be doing. They're protecting my resources. I'd say there's about a 99% chance that they've got a good laying queen down there. I don't need to go any further in my estimation. Um, I may get some criticism for that, but again, I believe in easy keeping. If you can read the hive like this and just look for problems, problems are easier to spot sometimes than uh, seeing if everything's right. You know, I could dive down into this box, check for eggs, roll the queen, squish the queen, kill her, and make the hive queenless. Uh, this is pretty safe, and in my estimation, it's, uh, it's gonna be good enough to know that this hive is okay. Smoker's really going. Ooh. All right, I don't see it. This box has any wax being drawn so I'll probably jump down below just jump right into the center if there's brood in this top box that's where I would expect it to be Looks like we have had some brood emerge and they've backfilled with honey. So this top box is nothing but honey now. I'm not seeing a tremendous population here, which concerns me. So I will dive down into the second box. Try to make sure that they're queen right. And I'm sure I'm going to pop a lot of honey loose doing this. Quite a bit. Still not seeing a tremendous population here. I did see a little bit of drone brood on the bottom of some of those uh, frames. So I'm going to hop into the middle of this box and just see what I can see.
This is why I use black plastic foundation. You can uh, see eggs pretty easily if there are eggs to see. And I've got none in here. I've got a little drone brood across the bottom. No eggs, but they are polishing cells. So it's possible that they've got, are trying to supersede or requeen themselves. But uh, the population situation has me concerned. All right, girls, calm down. They're acting pretty uh, testy. That is a sign of a queenless hive. They're back filling brood comb here. Seeing no signs of a queen. So I think what I'm going to do with them is uh, give them a frame of, of eggs from another hive. I could monitor them, I could combine them, um, but it seems like they're dwindling and I think they've still got the ability to make a queen. I don't know if they're queenless or not. They could be uh, in the process of superseding. It's not going to hurt anything to give them a frame of eggs or larvae and uh, it may end up saving the colony. So I'll, uh, I'll try to find a frame and then just give it to them. All right, so I'm stealing this frame, which has capped brood here, brood of all ages, really. There's some eggs over here. There's some eggs up in here. So I'm going to give this to this colony. And if they're not laying worker yet, that should keep them from going laying worker. If they need eggs to make a queen with, that should give them the ability to do that. I'll take this comb and give it to the other colony. Whoa! Hey, snake! Snake! Snake, you scared me. Whew. Mr. Gray Rat Snake. I forget what his Latin name is. It's Panthera something. No, I think he just figured out I'm not something he wants to play with. Come on, buddy. Get on out of here. All right, so before that snake surprised the bejeebers out of me, I was saying that I don't think this hive's got the population to handle four boxes. So I'm pulling this top box, and I think they had some drone brood or something on these two frames when I pulled honey, so I just put them in this top box. That's another reason that I do this. Um, if you have any frames that, that have brood in them, you can just drop them straight in here, put them back on. It's super easy to harvest, and I can deal with it a week later if I want to. So what I'll do is uh, go give these two frames to another hive over here uh, that's got some foundations. And um, I'll just pull this box off and that'll make it a little easier for me to check uh, progress on this hive in about uh, 
three or four days, I should be able to see if they're, if they're pulling emergency cells off of those eggs that I gave them. So the last thing that putting these supers on and feeding a, a bit during summer does is uh, dearth management. Now, here in Tennessee, we typically have a couple months of dearth depending on the weather uh, in the summer. Right now, we don't have anything blooming but white clover and white mouth dayflower, and the bees are not really working either one of those. So there's not much coming in for the bees. And unemployed bees, uh, if, they, if bees don't have honest work to do, they will find dishonest work to do. They will go and find a nuke somewhere and rob it out and kill that hive and bring those resources back. Uh, so we do get a pretty heavy robbing season in some years here, uh, depending on how much rain we get. So by giving these bees a trickle of syrup through the summer and giving them some wax to draw, they've got honest work to do and that helps prevent this dishonest work of robbing. I also attack this in a different way in that I've got some plantings for the bees. I've got about two acres of buckwheat that will be blooming within a week. Um, I've got several, other, several more plots that are eh, probably four or five acres. Um, I've got some sweet clover, some red clover, white clover that are all blooming. So it, it gives the bees something to do. So another key to summer management is pest and parasite management. Uh, this is a time of year when small hive beetles become a real problem. The biggest issue though is Varroa destructor, the Varroa mite, and it's because uh, the bee population is declining into the summer dearth. And at the same time, Varroa is catching up and will actually surpass the population of bees. And when it reaches its peak, if you've got fewer bees than you do mites, that's probably gonna be a dead out going into the fall. Um, another key point with Varroa is that I think what I am doing to increase my colony size to make these massive colonies, they've got huge brood patterns. That makes them susceptible to Varroa mites, more so than a small nuke would be. So I'm creating this situation that could kill these colonies off by making them so large. I feel like it's my responsibility to give them some help with the problem I'm giving them. So right now, I'll go through all of my hives and do oxalic acid vaporization treatments. I do six treatments at four day intervals. I found that to work very well. Uh, that actually covers the, the drone um, brood cycle. So even, even mites that are in drone brood will get treated during this 24 day period. Small hive beetles can become a big problem at this time of year, especially in some years. Last year was notably bad. This year has not been as bad, but I have seen beetle populations picking up recently. So there's really four things that I do to set my hives up to deal with small hive beetles. The first and most important, and this is the cure-all to a lot of problems that you can get with bees, is to make sure you have the right size hive for the population that is within that hive. So if you have too small of a population with too much comb to protect, that gives small hive beetles the opportunity to take over and overrun the hive. Uh, the beetle larvae will slime through the comb. Bees won't use that comb after it's been slimed. It just becomes a, a huge mess. It can force the, the bees to abscond in some cases. So make sure you've got the right size hive. And if your populations are shrinking, get your honey supers off, take boxes off, give them to other hives if you need to, go and stick them in the freezer if you need to, uh, in order to get that hive to, the, to a size that the bees can protect and defend. So the second thing that I do to deal with beetles is to put my hives in full sun. And this is something that I've learned. Uh, when I first started, I had my hives in another yard about a quarter mile away. And those, those hives are in shade at least part of the day. And for a lot of different reasons, I'm eventually gonna move all of those over to here and just have this one yard of bees. And all of these hives are in full sun year round. And I find that I have far fewer beetles in this yard than I do the yard that is in partial shade. So if you've got a box that is the right size for the population of bees within it, and you put that box in full sun, 
you're going to have far fewer beetle problems than if you give them a box that's too big and you put it in the shade. The third thing that I do to help my bees resist small hive beetle is I actually set my stands up on a piece of roofing metal. And this is dark green roofing metal. I set the stands toward the back edge because part of the small hive beetle life cycle is that they've got to leave this hive, come out to the ground, burrow into the ground, and then become, grow into an adult. So with this roofing metal in the hot summer sun, if a beetle larvae crawls out and falls onto this roofing metal, there's a good chance it's going to get scorched and die before it can complete its life cycle. A side benefit of having the roofing metal down here and setting the hives toward the back edge is mowing and weed eating. Uh, I can do those far less frequently than I would need to uh, because I, can't, I don't get grass growing up in front of the hives nearly as quickly. The fourth thing that I do to help my bees deal with small hive beetle is to use oil tray bottom boards. You can see that this is a screened bottom that has a very tight fitting tray that holds vegetable oil. So the bees can push those beetles through the screen, they fall into the vegetable oil and then they die. I'll do a separate video on these oil trays at some point because uh, they are a pretty specialized case. There's some things I really like about them and there's some things I really don't like about them, but the strengths that they have are very strong. And as you can see, this is a giant beetle trap. The, the trap area is the full size of this tray. So there's a tremendous amount of surface area there that is ready to catch beetles year round. So I really do like the fact that these oil trays kill small hive beetles and it's a, a giant small hive beetle trap and I can access this trap, change the oil without going into the hive. Whereas beetle blasters and things like that, you've got to put those in the, in the boxes and it's just a lot more management, a lot more in and out of the hive to use those. These will also capture and kill wax moth and beetle larvae and wax moth larvae. So they help to break that life cycle they also will capture and kill varroa mites that uh, fall through the screen and land in the oil. But a big thing for me is that since I went to these oil trays, I actually quit doing mite washes, uh, alcohol washes to do mite counts. What I do now is I do my oxalic acid vaporization treatment and I'll come back in two or three days and pull the oil tray and look at my mite counts and it's either gonna be a lot or it's not gonna be a lot. So it gives me an idea if I have problem hives or if I have certain hives that are dealing with Varroa better than others. And I used this to good effect last fall. I actually found a hive that had robbed out a failed hive or a dead out somewhere and it brought back thousands upon thousands of mites. And because of these oil trays, I was able to find that and get that hive saved before they went into winter. If I'd been doing mite washes, unless I did mite washes in October, there's no way I would have found that. So um, I really do like these to be able to monitor my Varroa populations uh, just from a total pest standpoint. I, I think they, they, like I said, they've got some really strong strengths and also some pretty big weaknesses for some operations. Well guys, it is hot today. <laughs> it's 90 degrees. Over 80% humidity. Um, I've sweat through my sweatband and everything I'm wearing. It's, uh, it's been a hot one. I wanted to wrap up things down here. This is the buckwheat that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm actually doing a video on this, a long, kind of a long-term video, planting all the way through bloom. Uh, this stuff is just starting to bloom, so it'll probably reach full bloom sometime next week. And bees just love it. Um, and during this dearth period that we've got coming up, it gives my bees something to do. You know, they, they won't really gain weight off of this, I don't expect, they may. I don't really care. Um, I just want them to have something to work. Uh, that helps prevent robbing, just makes the bees happy and healthy to have some pollen and nectar coming in. So I think that's a good thing to do if you can. I want you guys to know that I appreciate the comments on my videos. I try to respond to every one of those. So if you have a question, 
feel free to ask. You can also send me an email, nathan at duckriverhoney.com. Try to respond to all of those. Uh, really appreciate the interaction with you guys and the encouragement that you give me. So on this subject of summer hive management, uh, I put together a presentation a few weeks ago and spoke for a, a bee club in Ohio and uh, made some slides and things. Um, so I'm sure there's something I have forgotten during this video. And I will put a companion article up on my website, duckriverhoney.com. I'll link to that in the description. That written format really allows me to go into more detail and plan things out better. Um, it, it just works well for me. I'm a little scatterbrained sometimes and forgetful. So things went well today. Um, I identified three hives that are either queenless or in the process of requeening. One was for sure queenless. It was laying worker. It was a small swarm that probably had a virgin in it and she didn't come back. Probably got eaten by a dragonfly. Um, so I went ahead and shook them out and combined them with another hive that I think may be queenless. They may be going laying worker, um, but they may have requeened themselves and she's just getting started. So I'm gonna give them another week or two and see. And then the, the hive that you saw, the honey production hive, they're either queenless or they just superseded. I don't know. Um, I gave them a frame of brood that's got some eggs in it. That pheromone should keep them from going laying worker if they're not already. And eggs will allow them to make a queen if they are queenless. So I'll go back in a few days and check them. And if they've started pulling emergency cells off of there, then I'll know that they're queenless for sure. So I got my oxalic acid treatment done, um, monitored varroa drops on my oil trays. All my hives are looking pretty good. I don't see any glaring issues. I've got a, a few nukes that I've got to get sorted out. I did split a hive that was a double deep and uh, split them with a double screen board. So that's basically a walk away split. I'll go back in a day or two and see which one the, the queen is in. Um, it's pretty easy. You split them and then go and look and see which one's got emergency cells in it. And that's the one that doesn't have the queen. Um, so I don't like making new queens this time of year. The mating success is just not that good, but I really don't like having that double deep. I can't checkerboard them in the spring like I do my other hives. So I really want to get them into a deep and a medium. You know, guys, I'm hot and sweaty and tired, but I feel like I did something today. And um, it's just peaceful, peaceful here, listening to the cicadas and sitting in the shade. Really, you know, being hot makes you appreciate the shade. So it's a pretty spot down here. I love buckwheat when it's in full bloom. It just turns the whole field pure white, absolutely gorgeous. Guys, I appreciate you watching. Please give me a like, subscribe to my channel, hit the bell for notifications. If you haven't, that will allow you to get an alert when I post new videos so you don't miss anything. I appreciate it and I'll see you next time.